So, um, yes, I've written this book. Um, it's essentially about how the internet is changing the way we tell stories. And the short answer to that is uh, by making them nonlinear, by making them participatory, and by making them immersive. But why is that? And um, what are the point, I suppose? Uh, what does that mean for brands? So I'm here to talk for a bit about brands as publishers. I was in Sydney a couple of weeks ago, and I was walking down the street rather late at night back to my hotel, um, pondering the great questions of life, such as, why is it that most people profess to hate advertising even though they love brands? Now, that's when I saw this. It was on a bus shelter. It was an ad for V, uh, the number one energy drink in Australia and New Zealand. And the message they wanted to get across was a very simple one. Advertising equals hey you plus buy this. It's very meta, of course. And what it brings home is that while brands are a part of life, advertising is seen as intrusive. The thing about this ad, though, is it actually means exactly the opposite of what it says. Because advertising doesn't equal hey you plus buy this at all anymore. It used to, but the very fact that you would see this as an ad slogan means that those days are over. Those days, of course, were defined by this man, Rosser Reeves, the author of Reality and Advertising, the Bible of Sterling Cooper, the agency at the start of Mad Men. Reeves, of course, um, propounded the idea of the unique selling proposition, the idea that every brand has a unique advantage and that Madison Avenue's job is to drive that advantage home. Um, under Reeves, this is what they published. They wanted to dramatize the benefits of the product. They wanted to hammer the message in. They promised fast, fast, fast relief for the headache they've just given you. The idea being that people will then rush out and buy the product. The message was unmistakable. It worked because this was the audience. Not just passive, but hopelessly naive. Television was very new at the time. In fact, in the late 1940s, when it was just getting started, Variety heralded its advent with a headline that talked about the advent of the new see here waves. And that's what you see here. You see people consuming the new see here waves that are coming out of their TV set. They're consuming the broadcast. They're consuming the newspaper. They're consuming the Coke. They're an easy mark. That didn't work forever, of course. When the 60s came, Reeves' approach ran out of fashion. The ad guys tried toning it down with campaigns such as this one. The message got quieter. In fact, it got ostentatiously quiet. But the message itself didn't change, just the way it was packaged. And as we all know, um, new packaging only gets you so far. The underlying view was the same, as if this was how people imagine the brain works, rational, predictable, mechanistic, as if a mash of whirring gears. Um, this view was a product of an industrial mindset, um, not just in advertising, but in the entire media industry, as if the sprockets in film or video meshed somehow with the sprockets in your head in a logical, linear progression of thought. This idea of a logical linear progression, in fact, underlies all mass media, because mass media is a product of the Industrial Revolution. What we see here is the first issue of the New York Times in 1851, an artifact that signaled the rise of mass media. Suddenly, you could reach hundreds of thousands, ultimately millions of people with a single product. It was efficient, but it was also very, very costly. Jokai Benkler of Harvard in a TED talk a few years ago pointed out that in 1835 you could start such a paper with the equivalent in today's dollars of $10,000. Fifteen years later, the same thing cost two and a half million. 
This had the effect of creating a hierarchy of storytellers and consumers. And the message for, from the storytellers was, whether they were advertisers or editors or reporters, the message was the same. It was, hey you, read this, watch this, buy this. Flash forward 75 years. By the 1920s, the nascent motion picture industry had created Hollywood the Dream Factory, an entire industry devoted to the mass production of fantasy, the mass production of stories. For most of history, storytelling had been something we all did. People told stories to one another, they shared them with one another. But now, with newspapers, books, magazines, movies, records, and ultimately, of course, television, stories became something you passively consumed. And pretty soon, that came to seem to be the natural order of things. For a planet of consumers, hey, you, buy this, seemed a reasonable proposition. But with the advent of digital technology, the media equation was suddenly turned upside down. Apple's 1984 ad was not just an attack on IBM and the regimented drones it represented. Steve Jobs and Lee Tlau were heralded into the advent of a new world, a world in which it wouldn't cost millions of dollars to reach millions of people, a world in which you could do it for $10,000 or, in fact, eventually a lot less. The effect of all this was that brands no longer had a passive audience in which they could shout their benefits at, but an active and increasingly sophisticated audience that was learning to filter out the messages that were intrusive. Now brands had to win people's attention. And at the same time, thanks to another side of digital technology, we finally began to understand the brain. The brain was the ultimate black box throughout most, most of history. But by the 1990s, it was hard to delude ourselves that we were rational creatures given to linear thought processes. It was obvious that the mind did not work like a bunch of gears, that in fact it was more like this, plastic, emotional, ever-changing, although maybe perhaps not quite so orange. When you really get into it, though, it looks like this. It's still hard to say exactly how it works, but it sure doesn't work like a gear. What neuroscience is telling us about stories, in fact, is that we experience them as if they were happening to us. We owe this understanding to a monkey in Parma. The year was 1991, and a group of neuroscientists at the university there were sticking electrodes in monkeys' heads. They, were, they wanted to map the frontal lobe, which is the area that's used in rehearsing actions. They wanted to see which neurons were firing. What they found was something very, very uh, surprising, that the neurons that were used were very specialized. That, in fact, the monkey had one neuron for holding something and another neuron for tearing it apart. Then, during a break, something surprising happened. A research assistant was eating an ice cream cone, and a monkey was watching him. And as the monkey was watching, somebody happened to notice that the neuron that was lighting up in the monkey's head was the same neuron that would be firing if the, if the monkey itself had been eating the ice cream cone. They wanted to see if this was really happening, so they tried a bunch of other things. They put some food on the table, they took the food off the table. Each time they got the same results. Whatever uh, was happening uh, to the, in real life was happening in the rehearsal neuron of the monkey. Um, this gave rise to the idea of mirror neurons, the idea that we're acting out the uh, experience as we're, an experience as we're watching it. Now, you can't stick electrodes in human brains, of course, but the findings uh, of this early experiment have subsequently been uh, res um, uh, supported by um, fMRI research that's been done. fMRI uh, measures blood flow in the brain, it doesn't tell you what you're thinking, what people are thinking. It does tell you what part of the brain is doing the thinking. At Washington University a couple of years ago, um, they did fMRIs of people who were reading stories. The stories were from a book called One Boy's Day. 
about a seven-year-old named Raymond. Um, and what they found was that when people read about Raymond picking up a workbook, the part of the brain that deals with grasping motions lit up in readers' heads. When, when Raymond walks to the teacher's desk, the area of the brain that deals with spatial location lights up. The conclusion that the um, researchers reached was that um, readers understand the story by simulating events in the story world. In other words, they don't consume a story. They reenact it in their own heads. Perceptions aren't created by marketers or authors. They're imagined in partnership by uh, marketers and civilians together. Matthew Weiner creates Mad Men, and we empathize with the characters. We imagine ourselves on Madison Avenue. We see Roger Sterling's martini, and our martini neuron lights up. Now, in 2007, these learnings officially entered the lexicon of the ad industry with a report from the 4As and the ARF. It was a groundbreaking study that derided the uh, quote-unquote input-output engineering model of advertising. It said that we don't just buy the brand with the most compelling proposition, that purchase decisions are very emotional, and what's more, that emotions can be measured, which is important because, as we all know in the ad business, if it can't be measured, it doesn't exist. It also said that purchase decisions are nonlinear, that they're unpredictable, in other words, that it's not a think, feel, do scenario. It's more something like, you know, we feel, do, and then think. And finally, um, that perceptions are not created by marketers, but are co-created by consumers. In other words, we all bring something to the, to the table. That any story, advertising or otherwise, has its own characters and situations, and that we respond and make them our own. This means that, essentially, the 20th century ad industry is based on an illusion, the illusion that we're just passive consumers. And for that matter, not just the ad industry, but the entirety of mass media. So where does that leave us? How should the industry respond? Brian Boyd of the University of Auckland has written a fascinating book called On the Origin of Stories. It's an evolutionary take on storytelling. Among other things, Boyd writes about disarming the ad filter that sophisticated, audience, that sophisticated audiences put up. He writes about how messages become louder and louder, more and more repetitive, until you have to, be, until you have to roar to be heard amid the clutter. And yet, the louder and more repetitive you get, the more resistant people are to the message. Signals used for cooperative purposes, he adds, conspiratorial whispers, will be energetically cheap and informationally rich. I love that phrase, energetically cheap, informationally rich. It's about how you disarm the filter with a conspiratorial whisper, because whispers, as we all know, tend to get passed along. Think about the iconic ad campaigns of the last decade, like this one, Subservient Chicken, from, for Burger King, in which uh, Crispin Porter Bogusky wanted to communicate Burger King's Have It Your Way slogan with a chicken that would respond to uh, your commands. Now, some people in the ad business complained that it didn't mention the product. It didn't, you know, say anything about the product. But in fact, that was entirely the point. Because people really don't want to hear about how great your product anymore, about how great your product is anymore. People don't want your product to give them a headache. They want it to give them a good time. Wyden and Kennedy, uh, much more recently, with the Man Your Man Could Smell Like campaign, started with an entertaining story uh, that made Isaiah Mustafa, a, a football player that nobody in America or anywhere else in the world, by the way, had ever heard of before, an overnight pop culture sensation. But then they had the question of how could viewers connect with him? That's when they came up with the idea of the Old Spice response videos, 
which invited people to send in questions on Twitter, and they responded as soon as possible on YouTube over a two-day period. They got questions from people like Kevin Rose, the founder of DIG, and Cliff Lezinski, the creator of Gears of War. They created a dialogue with viewers, but more than that, they created a game to engage viewers. Because they weren't telling a story, they were doing what all games do, which is giving people their own stories, stories they could share, which they did. Because from February, when the campaign started, to July, when the, uh, when the, when the um, response campaign happened, they got 130 million views on YouTube. Now, the fact is that you can't roar people into submission. You, you can't shout, hey, you buy this, and expect it to work. You need to engage the conspiratorial whisper. You need to be, get people to share your message, to spread your story. And to do that, you need to publish something they want. Brands need to surprise and to delight. Because brands are no longer products with a story attached. Increasingly, brands are the story, the experience of and around the product. Advertising needs to offer something to the user. It has to add value to our lives because it's not about pitching the product anymore. It's about creating an experience around the product, an experience people will want to talk about, an experience they will share. And that means that you're not the brand custodian anymore. They are. The audience is. It doesn't mean, however, that you're powerless. It does mean that you need to make your power felt in inverse proportion to your presence. Thank you. Thank you for talking at the, at the beginning of that about the influence of uh, what you might call an advertising philosopher, someone like Ross and Reeves, and obviously people like Birnbach as well. You know, they had particular ways of doing things, Lee Clow. Do you think in, in the modern world, in the current world, that there are individuals who are going to set the tone the way they did? Or given that now media essentially is distributed to everyone, are, are the new ways of doing things just kind of going to emerge from uh, group activity? No, I think they're very much individuals who, who, who set the tone. Uh, you know, people like Bob Greenberg, obviously. Um, I think that um, uh, the reason for that is that it takes a... It, it's not easy to, uh, to do this sort of thing. You really have to uh, be willing to experiment, and that means that you have to be willing to fail. Um, you can't keep on doing the same old thing. That's the easy thing to do, and that's what, you know, frankly, lots of people in the uh, ad business, um, you know, clients and agencies alike, would be happy uh, enough to keep on doing. Um, I think it takes uh, people who are, who are, you know, willing to... Uh, who are willing to take risks and willing to fail in order to move us forward. And do you think from the, the study of neuroscience that you were discussing with us earlier, is there now a real imperative that any form of advertising communication has to actually reward us as viewers or listeners or readers of it? We, we have to really engage with it as a story, much more so than we've ever done before. That, that's what the arrival of digital media has kind of taught us. Right. I think it doesn't necessarily have to involve a story that, uh, that, that the brand is telling. I think it has to, it does have to engage us in some way. I think it has to offer us something. Um, uh, it's sort of like um, when you are, you know, when you're in a Middle Eastern bazaar and you're buying a rug or thinking about buying a rug, uh, or, you know, you, you walk in, you don't just, you know, sort of like, uh, hear about the, 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 the advantages of this particular rug or that rug, you're invited in, you're given a cup of tea, you know, they talk to you for a long time, and, um, the, the, you know, they share, uh, you know, whatever knowledge they have about the, uh, the, the whole rug-making process with you, and, um, and, and that becomes, a, that, that's an important, you know, precursor to the actual transaction. I think that's increasingly the way things are going. I think that, that people need to be uh, engaged with some form of, uh, you know, the, 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 where it is content, I suppose, something that, uh, 
that, that they can you know, take home with them that doesn't have uh, you know, strictly to do with the product itself. Just something that's entertaining, something that's fun, something they can share. Frank, thank you very much. Thank you to Frank Reynolds. <laughs>